Kia ora, welcome to the Whakapuawai podcast series developed by the Centre for Indigenous Psychologies. During this series, we aim to deepen understandings about what Indigenous psychologies are and why they matter. Through our conversations with Indigenous people who are leaders in their areas of expertise, we will highlight how Indigenous psychologies are guiding, being incorporated into and transforming ways of thinking and doing across a range of disciplines and applied areas. So join us on this journey as we delve into the varied worlds of Indigenous peoples and better appreciate how Indigenous psychologies are affecting positive change in Aotearoa, New Zealand and beyond. In this podcast, our Kairangaho Research Officer Lorena is privileged to sit down and chat with Dr. Hokerere Valentine. Born and raised in Hiretaunga, Ngati Kahununu, Hokerere affiliates to the tribes of Ngaitahu, Te Atiawa, Tuwhare Toki Kawero, Ngatiawa, Ngaitu Hoi, and Ngapuhi. She has been a practicing clinical psychologist for 16 years and has worked within the areas of forensics, mental health, student research, clinical and cultural supervision, chronic health conditions, and psycho-oncology. Hukurere is currently the Haumaru Tautoko Hauera within the Health Conditions and Cancer Psychology Services in the Massey Psychology Clinic on the Turitia campus. She's also involved in the Clinical Psychology Training Program at Massey University with a specific focus around the incorporation and advancement of a bicultural component within that program. Her research interests centre on the consideration and development of Māori models of psychological practice and she has a particular passion for wairua and well-being. Among her many talents, she was the first Māori wahine to graduate with a Doctorate of Clinical Psychology at Massey University and she also has recently authored a number of book chapters as well as a seminal journal article based on the findings of her doctoral thesis entitled Whakairia Kirunga: The Many Dimensions of Wairua. Please enjoy this kōrero between Lorena and Hukariri. Kia ora and welcome Hukariri. It is an honour to have you here with us at the Centre for Indigenous Psychologies sharing you kōrero as part of the Whakapua Wai podcast series. Welcome. From the practice of, of clinical psychology, through the research, through teaching, through supervision, through all of that, what is it like in the sense of being a wahine Māori to be in those spaces, to, to be who you are in all of those different um, parts of your mahi? So it's an interesting question, eh? You know, how I, how I actually got here to begin with, uh, which is probably really, really important. And, it, and I share this story in my thesis, um, so it's an old story, but it's, it's, a, it's an important one. Um, so I grew up in, in, a, in, in a very rural environment. My, um, my grandmother was a Ringatū from um, the Bay of Plenty. She was raised in Kahuni. That's a whole different story. Um, her and her four cousins were literally brought to Kahuni to keep the connection between Tuwharetua and Kahuni. Okay. Yeah, that's what it says in her Whakapapa book. So um, my grandmother was living with her, my grandfather was at Atala, so my parents were very much culturally steeped. Yeah. I want to be better word. Back, back then, though, I, didn't, I had no clue about 
colonisation because it was very rural. But in any case, I, my grandmother was, was a, a healer and she came from a, lo- a lineage of Tohunga. Um, and so apparently she knew that and there were a whole range of things that happened with me. So she followed me and did things with me that I later learnt was her way of being able to, to keep, keep aligning where I'm supposed to be because she knew what I was supposed to do. And I thought, yeah, I was a lot older by then and, I, and she'd passed away by the time I figured that out. But in any case, I, I grew up with Waidwa experiences, mm. so I, they were a natural part of my upbringing to the point where, you know, I could have these conversations and these challenges with, with what would look like to the outside world. I'm having this challenge with myself, but that's me questioning. So I knew that at some stage I was going to end up at a university and back then I didn't want to. Uh, yeah. It was a Pākehā environment. It's not where Māori went. You know, all the colonial sort of stuff that comes with that. Yeah. Um, but I knew that it was... Okay, so I decided in all my wisdom, back in the teenage stage when, you know, it's all about you and that's self-centred, so I decided I was going to challenge the universe. And so you give me all of these things and I'll go to university. And then I thought, hmm, that's pretty clever. They're not going. I'm not going to get all of those things because you know I was thinking I know what I, I know what you're going to give me and it's not those. So I let it go, and you know, about a, it must have been about six months to a year later, I was I was having a sleep in, in our room and my husband was in the lounge with with my daughter and I heard this voice say, "Now that you have everything you ask for, what are you going to do?" And I thought, I remember waking up sitting straight up and everything I asked for kind of flashed in front of my face and I went, damn it, not quite how I wanted, how I envisaged I was going to get it. But, you know, that was a lesson learnt. Be, be careful what you ask for. You might just get it. And at that point I had to concede that I lost the bet. But that's the reason why I ended up here. Because so that's followed me and... Into into university and you know this is why I did my thesis on Wade were. Um but I think one of the important factors to that is that I don't think I operated at full capacity in terms of Wade because this is not an environment that welcomes, especially back then, someone who talks about spirit. Because back then, and one of my friends yeah. um, had said to me one time, you know, you're lucky, you know, you could have ended up in and some of those, uh, you know, the psychiatric wards. Mm. And I went, yeah. And it didn't <laughs> even occur to me at the time until she said it, and I went, oh, you're right. Yeah. yeah. Lucky I didn't say it. <laughs> Not too bad. <laughs> but it, that, that was, you know, so I think what I, I focused on that and it stayed a bigger part of why I was here. Not necessarily anything else. Mm. I was going to get through because I told them that I would do it. Not necessarily because I had to engage it, because what I should have done back then was engaged with what does that actually mean, and, you know, all the researchy stuff that we do now. Is there a bigger purpose to this? Am I missing something? What are, you know, all of those sorts of questions to get to where I needed to get to. Because um, I got to the end, and I can, I can pretty much pick points where, you know, the way to a, intervention ensured that I got through because, you know, I was still doing the ah, I don't want to be here. <laughs> <laughs> and then I came from, from a, a small rural community as everyone was related to an environment that that is not like that. But I'd shifted. I'd shifted into this other realm. And so that allowed me to keep to keep going because of that. And I shut a lot of things out. And I and I remember reading parts of your thesis and and, and absolutely it, there is a for me a seminal piece is a transformational piece in this field. One of the professors <laughs> at the time had said to me because I went to talk to her and she says to me, "Whatever possessed you to do such a difficult topic?" And I looked at her and I thought, "Who said it's difficult?" You know, because that was my might be difficult for you, but I had trouble actually answering that question because I didn't actually didn't see it as difficult yeah. and it was something that I was supposed to do 
and that if that's the case, then I'd be guided through it. And one of the things I'd say to people, because everyone would say, you know, it's it's a topic that you shouldn't really write down. And I said, well, you know, my, in my mind, people that are meant to understand it will. And those that don't won't. And that's OK. It, doesn't matter. it was very simple for me. Um, you know, the, if I were had to, if someone had asked me, I'd still say the same thing. It wasn't meant to be. But I'd said to her, it's, it's a natural part of what I grew up with, then yeah. it's important. And there's, um, you know, we always learn with our elders, there's parts of the story that are, that are only open to you when you're ready. Yeah. When yeah. you're ready for that. And then sometimes you will never be ready for that. Yep. And and that's okay. And it's okay. You know? Exactly. Yeah. Because I think I remember listening to myself saying all that, and there's a part of me going, "Yeah, I hope you're right." <laughs> <laughs> and I had a um a, a quarter or many years later with one of, and I was working in corrections at the time with the yeah. cultural um, consultant at the time, and he goes, we "Were having this discussion about things?" And he said to me. Yeah, I'll have to go back and read your thesis again. And I'm going, again? What do you mean again? He goes, oh, I've read it three times already. <laughs> Why? Why is that? Because, you know, he doesn't need to, he knew mm. his knowledge. And he says, well, it reminds me of my purpose because I understand the stories. I went, oh, yeah. So that, that was the whole, see, people who did need to... Yeah. Would, and because I was thinking, oh, oh, okay, so it didn't actually matter if people, their knowledge, at their knowledge, some of the stories are just going to be what's important for them, which made sense for me. And I thought, oh, cool, awesome. How is Wairua for you being understood and expressed in psychological practice mm. at the moment? Yeah, I think um, as we deal, I think in the currently in the in the um, in the clinic, and we work a lot with people who have health conditions, and that actually means that that this group we're more likely to see people who are culturally secure than we would do if we were dealing specifically with mental health. So we've had people that are very steeped in their in their indigeneity, in a better word, who who have come, and sometimes I've um, shifted into. Because hey, I'd walk in and you know, sometimes it's not as easy to to gauge. But I thought, I remember one, this was many, many years ago, I would um, did a home visit with one of our clients and he, he was the tuakana of his family, had diabetes, had shingles at the time and there was a lot going on and there was a lot of, there was a rift in his family. But when I walked into the, into his home and I did what we would normally do, you know, take your shoes off. Mm. Be be respectful, which is part and parcel of setting up that the way to a space. Mm-hmm. Thing. And, and for, so what I did, and and I do it, I do do it. But this particular time, I decided to shift into that space and listen to him. So he told me this whole story, and and I listened to him. And then so what I then did was shifted into talking to a fucker papa with the minister because you know all this stuff. Because he did. But I was doing the whole, what am I, what am I supposed to say? <laughs> so I followed what was what I was being given. And so we talked a lot about his role versus the, the younger sibling that he was in battle with. Yeah. Um, and at the end of the conversation, he said to me, OK, well, that's good. So, I, you know, it was good. And I thought, mm. Hopefully, whatever it was we were supposed to get, he got. I went back to the next, the next week to see him, and he. I walked in, and he looked lighter. And I looked at him, and he says, "So, I did what you told me to do." And I looked at him, and I thought, well, "What did I tell you to do?" And he said, "Well, you, you said that I needed to talk to my sister." And I said, "Did I?" <laughs> okay. Cool. But that's what the quarter war, the fuck up a quarter war was about, and that's what he got. So he went off and did did this conversation with his sister. Mm-hmm. And as as a result, they mended that. And it came back to them. So I didn't actually say, you need to go and talk to your sister. 
We did what Māori do, and, and I did the passive kōrero, which we get from Kaumātua, and a whole talk around here, and if you get what you're supposed to get, then that's what you get. Um, and I thought, wow, that worked well. I, th- I left that first session not knowing if what... I just had to trust in the fact that the connection was there, and it, and it was so, you know, it was a really good... They don't always work that way, mm. I do have to say, but... Um, I often will shift into the way to space to converse with them. Mm. Um, and then I allow, because, you know, there's a connection where I have to be able to. Um, and some of them are good. And there's one in, a, in the Ora book, mm. um, the one that was edited by Leonie Pihama yes. and Linda Tuhema Smith. Smith. Yes. Um, I tell a, a story about a, a queer, and she was a nurse, and so this particular story doesn't actually go quite to the way I think it was. But when I got to her house, she had a heart condition and she was standing on her veranda and her her status, I guess, hit me with like a ton of bricks. Oh. And I got out of the car and thought, what the heck <laughs> was that? <laughs> um, so I went into her house a little bit dazed by that. And I thought, well, OK. So I shifted into... Uh, psychologist mode <laughs> um, and she'd said to me would you like a cup of tea and I said I'm fine thank you I've just had one and I knew at that point that that was the wrong answer but I was still dazed by what what I was hit with and so we carried on talking she was asking me who I was what I was doing and it, that continued she said to me what about a glass of water mm. so I'm fine thank you oh. fine. Mm. and I thought Shut up. Stop <laughs> saying that. <laughs> but, you know, we carried on. And then the third time she said to me, what about a cake? I've just baked the cake. And at that point it dropped. And I went, I'd love to. Thank you for it. And she did. So we shifted into, and then we sh- I realised, which I haven't put in the chapter, but what I realised was happening was I was mirroring what she was feeling in her health condition. She was stuck, because she's a nurse. She's a registered nurse. She knows her stuff. And yet she was lost in the fact that she's got this health condition and she didn't know what to do about it. And so I was mirroring that, which is what happens sometimes when you, you know, when you're with Fano and there's a way to experience, you can feel there. Yeah. But for me it was I had to experience that to be able to help her to shift out of it. Does that make sense? Entirely. Yeah. So I, I said, I used, I then used, because she was very Māori. Yeah. So if we talk about the stages of te pō, and uh, te kore versus te ao marama, and these spaces that we shift into, and the te pō space is the chaos, you know, where we're going through stuff. She goes, yeah, and I said, so where do you think you are in your journey? And she looked at me and she goes, hmm. Nobody's ever explained it to me like that before. I went, no, I hope that's a good thing. <laughs> she goes, okay. If I think about that, then that means I'm right, right next to the door, Ooh. shifting into. And I went, oh, that's a good place to be. I said, a good place to be. And she goes, I guess. Well, what do you need to do to get through the door? And she goes, well, I think I just need to ring my, my specialist up, have an appointment with them, and get things sorted. Okay. Sounds pretty simple. Let's do that. You know, we spend most of the time with me trying to get the the message of just have the cup of tea. <laughs> I contacted her a couple of weeks later. Yes. And she goes, Oh, okay, well, look at this. this is really bubbly. I said, oh, You sound a in a good mood. She goes, Well, I'm off to Australia next week. And you're going to have to do You're going to Oh, that's good. And, and so things went well then. And she says, Yep. I rang the cardiologist, had it sat down with him, got him to tell me straight, sorted a few things out, and I'm good. I went, OK. And I, I remember thinking at the time, now, had you have accepted the first cup of tea? <laughs> but I, I still think that when I needed to go through that to actually get the full extent of what was going on, well, to feel it, to share it, and then to be able to have this, you know, that modi space where you're sharing that with them and yes. to shift the dynamic, if that makes sense. And I have no doubt people are going to read that and think, 
Yeah, you should have known better. But that's why I think I had to go through it. Because sometimes I, I have this whole um, naivety in, mm. in that space, and it's not until later that I actually realise why it happened the way it happened. I learn about all of these things about my parents when I came to university, oh. and the whole idea of the language being, you know, but no, I didn't know that back then. But the whole generation of people who didn't speak Māori and, and being able to actually know that my mum actually did speak fluent Māori and it's quite funny when you know, I'm at high school learning te reo Māori and I've got a whole whānau of people that don't speak proper English and they speak... My grandmother couldn't couldn't speak... My, my grandmother spoke good English except when she was angry or when she was highly emotional... She couldn't get the language out fast enough, so she'd shift into Māori, and we knew then she was either really pissed off <laughs> or really get happy. out of the way. So I grew up with all of these people that, that speak a, a different language mm. to me. And my mum, I think, because she was part of that generation, they got caned for speaking Māori, and that whole thing about the conditioning of that behaviour, you know, because she already had, she was the Mātou, and she already had, because you know, there was already a lot of dysfunction around them. And so she already had this issues, for want of a better word. Mm. So having the school system add to that just made it more more likely that she was going to shut down the language. And so she did. But what she also did was ensured that I didn't go through that experience. And so she took the language away to ensure that I was safe. Yeah. Um, See, I didn't know that at the time. Yeah. No, I don't really care. But um, I learned that later. Because then my mum did the whole, I can't, I can't be anything other than Māori. Because my language is part and parcel of who I am. And so I have to accept that I'm a deficit because these people keep telling me that every time I speak who I am, they keep attacking me for it. And then so... I learned that a lot, a lot later, and so I do. I tell that story often because I can, because she's my mother. <laughs> but it's part of being able to explain to our students that when you have someone, this is this is what we're learning in psychology. And this is mm. actually what happened. Okay, so it's not as simple as they just stopped speaking the language and they were fine because they weren't. Uh, part of me feels really sorry for the fact that. Her English wasn't as good as it could have been because it was still it still said she was at a deficit in in her identity and so part of my ability to be here and I say to people I speak fluent English uh, by force not by choice it's the truth mm. if I had a choice I'd speak both languages fluently and I says I I can speak Māori but not to the level that I can speak English yeah and I'm I'm not happy about that. I've never... I am now. Because I've come to a point where my mother ensured that I was... that I could be safe with the language that she thought was going to save me. So I'm okay with that. So part of my being able to be okay with that is to, you know, if we think about the healing of that process, Mm. it heals my mother's hurt. I've met so many people that have had the same experience. Eh? And I've had clients that have been really whakamā because they don't speak fluent Māori and they've been in environments that it's been fluent and been able to say, that's OK, yeah. that's OK, is been able to actually be who you are and be OK with that. And so part of the, the healing in the, in the psychological session mm. is to actually help that because eh? those... Some of those people, not everyone, because some people do challenge it. And I said, but those that have been raised with it and those that are positive will not question you. They won't put you down. And some of that is actually coming from you. So we've been able to heal that part of of them so that they can keep, well, not the whole thing, but at least start the journey for them. So sometimes the therapy is as simple as being able to actually talk that story, because some people don't actually know that story. And so sharing that story with them and being able to get them to see that it, they were doing that to keep you safe. You know, and, and if they'd have known then, what they know now, they may not have done it, but they didn't. 
They didn't know that. They could only work off what they were working with. Mm. You know, and, and so some of that hara, I guess, is part of my journey to heal so that it doesn't end up with the next generation. Yeah. And, you know, like my kids speak fluent Māori, but being able to actually remind myself that that racism is still actually there and being able to help that generation to actually work through that. In psychology, the undergrad sort of stuff, and some of that helped me to to understand what was going on. We think about behavioural modification and all that. But I already knew, I already knew that, but adding that knowledge to it, being able to actually put the language to this is what was happening, and, you know, and being able to actually express that with our students. And, so, you know, we talk about conditioned behaviour. Yeah. You know, she, she leaves home speaking Māori, goes to school, gets cane for Māori, stops speaking Māori, goes back, speaks English. Family don't actually know what she's talking about, so she has to shift Switch. back into Māori. And then she forgets, goes back to school, speaks Māori, gets cane for it again. And so there's this whole cycle. Before you know it, there's these classical conditioning and these, this has been paired with that, which gives you this particular behaviour. Yes. And I says, and that's just my mum. Yes. And you imagine all of her siblings had that, and then, you know, the cousins and all of that. So some people maintained their, their deal for, for whatever reason that was, but there are other things around that that made it more likely for this group, for this group of people to not speak their language in, in the open. And but being able to understand that, I had to actually come to uni to to see all of that and the full extent of it. And when I first actually realised it, I remember getting really pissed off. You know, part of it, been over time, been able to say, you know, the, the glass half full mm. versus the glass half empty. And my mother did what she did because she, that's all she knew. And that, and that was fine. And I knew mm. that she was doing it because she cared for me and she didn't want me to get to have to suffer the same thing that she did. It would not have happened, but it might have happened differently. You know, so she couldn't take that chance. So she did, and with my, if I think about the idea that my mother, because my mother was, a, she was quite funny, you know, we, we would have, she would attack the different environments. Parker people scared her, mm. and mm. I understood why, because they were the ones that caned her yep. at school. So anxiety... She would shift into a different person when she was speaking to Bhagavad And we knew when she was on the phone speaking to someone that wasn't Māori because her language would change yes. and her whole self would change. And at the time it was quite giggly, you know, because she's talking to someone. But as I learnt more about psychology, I realised that that was anxiety yeah. uh, because or trauma because she'd been caned by these people. But if you put her in front of you know, Māori, and she wouldn't back down. Because in an environment where that made sense for her and it it was who she was, there was no way she was going to back down. So we had these two different competing personalities that that existed. You know, I remember there was a time when um, there was a... There was talk of someone had been going around at all of our homes and, and it wasn't a good thing. Mm. could see them outside, and this one particular night, one of my nephews was standing, he was only three at the time, he was standing up, and he could. He was looking out the window, because we live in the country, of course, and he kept saying koro, and my brother realised then there must be somebody outside, and my mother saw that. She gets up, goes, it turns the light, goes out the door, and all you saw was this person running across the paddock, and we're like, Mum, don't, you might get hurt, and she's standing there, you know. <laughs> expletives right across the paddock and ready to chase them across the paddock. And I was thinking, you know, I'm reflecting back on that. I think, so this person didn't have a problem with challenging that, but this other person could not survive effectively in a parkour environment because it scared her. And so those, being able to understand those are part and parcel of my journey is to be able to be comfortable in this space because it's something that she needed to heal that process. That Absolutely. It reminded yeah. me of, you know, when we talked earlier about um, when Tera 
at the Maramatanga session was talking about ehe, te wehe and one. And I remember yes. thinking, it, I must have that conversation because I was too busy thinking about the next <laughs> example with my mum. But she, um, one of my cousins slash niece, it's a long story, but anyway, <laughs> she had invited, she was doing a performing arts um, degree. Yeah. And my mum, she invited my mum to be her guest Guest of Honour, and that has never happened for my mum before. And we all went, but my mother was the guest of honour, and she managed to sit somewhere else. So we were all whānau sitting there. At the end of the graduation, the, the graduates got up and did some way of the arding, and my mum knew some of them. We all knew some of them. But at some point, while they were singing a way of the, my mum got up from her seat, and my auntie was going, what's your mother doing? I'm like, I don't know. And my mother, because my, there's my whānau mother, my biological mother, she looked at me, what's your mother doing? I don't know. She got up off her seat, walked down the aisle, walked across the front, onto the, walked up onto the stage and <laughs> performed with them. And we were all sitting there going, oh, no, what the heck, because that's not my mother. She, she's the person who stays in the kitchen, stands out and directs from behind. Yep. She yep. doesn't like being in the limelight. So for her to actually get up in front of a whole auditorium of people and ignore them and go right up onto the stage and perform was interesting. Because we were all sitting there looking at her going, what the heck just <laughs> So when we, afterwards, when I got a chance, I looked at her and I said, what was that? And her response to me was, well, when you feel the here, you have to follow it. And I looked at her and I was going, the, the psychological part in me back then was going, OK, so how do you enhance that so that you do that all the time? Because I mean, that doesn't happen all the time. Mm. What are the factors that led you to recognise that it was that, that led you to shift into this other person that didn't care who was all around? I mean, but there were a lot of things to that. I had to be in the right environment. She was already in that space of... Reciprocity because she'd been okay. an honoured guest, so she was already thinking like that. It was a totally Māori environment, it was full of whānau. And then there were a lot of things that led to the fact that it was going to occur. Yeah. We were just going, <laughs> she's not going to do that. <laughs> and it was, it was interesting, it stuck with me because I remember, remember continuing to think, what is that? Well, what do you mean? And I knew what it was, but her being a, you know, if, if I had, if she was still here, I would have then I went back to her and said, we need to talk about what are those things that lead to that, whether she knew what they were or not, because they're second nature for her. Yes. Yeah. But that's, that was the, the thing that, about my mother, she existed in two different spaces. Amazing, and being able to actually think if she was able to work through the trauma um, and what difference would that have made for, for what was normal for her. But one of the things I often talk with some of my Māori clients about, especially when they have trouble with uh, Pākehā environments, mm. and well, usually it's the doctors and the, the hospitals and stuff, and I've said to a few, you know, one of the things that we have is we, when I go to the doctor, I realised at one point that I shift into a different person. So I get to the door and I make a decision on whether I take the cultural person with me in or not. And sometimes I leave that cultural yeah. person outside because it's not safe for yeah. them in there. And I shift into the Pākehā person that they need me to be. Yeah. And will that person that will be safe enough to engage with them? Yeah. And I keep the Māori part of me safe, which is fine. I go in, talk to the doctor, get whatever it is I need to get, you know, and I walk out. Yeah. Grab the, put, put the cultural person back in. I said, but the problem is it might be the cultural person that needs to see the doctor. And so I leave there still unwell, I'm wondering what the heck just happened. I can see that it's not working. And that's because I'm not engaging fully in this process. There's only part of me that's in that session with them. And then being able to actually express it in, in that way, then people have been able to go, yeah, that makes sense. So, so what do you need to actually take that, the whole of yourself into that space? And how do you know when you've done that? And I'm part of my, my mother's age, because they would get dressed to the nines to go and see the doctor. And, you know, I realised that 
And so because my mothers, because of the way they were raised and what they were raised in and their connection to the to the lineage, their doctor the doctor in their mind was a Tonga. And so any doctor that they saw, that's their vision. It took me ages to figure that out. That's why they were so compliant. Because this the comeback of not listening was too severe. Yeah. You know, but not realising that this is a different environment. It brings me that, to that question I, um, I shared with you, and is that, you know, stepping into the world of academia, the world of practice for your clinical psychology, for all of that, the strengths of who you are as a Wahine Māori, as a mm. practitioner, as everything. We know those strengths, and we know um, through the stories that, that you have shared, the papa of that, in a way. But for you, what have been some of the challenges in doing this mahi, yeah. unapologetically being you, speaking yeah. who you are? Yeah. yeah. I think one of the... The racism is, is probably one of the biggest ones. Um, and I realise this. I'm the one in my family that's been in the Pākehā spaces, mostly on my own. So yeah. it's kind of a normal sort of... Thing, but you don't actually know how tense you are in those environments until you're in a completely Māori environment that helps you feel tight. And then you yeah. go, wow, <laughs> that doesn't happen over here. And I think, oh, OK, yeah. But I knew it was a part and parcel of that whole journey of shifting me into this space because that's what I needed. But the racism has been... been something, you know, Some of that is the whole idea that I don't see it sometimes. I hear it and I can feel it sometimes and sometimes somebody else has to give me the language to say that's what that was. Um, and often been it's difficult to to decide when and how you can talk about Wadewa. There's a misconception, I think, that in psychology, Western knowledge mm. is the gold standard. Yeah. And that... Yeah. that covers every culture, which is incorrect. Right? And if we think about... Because, you know, psychology is very Pākehā. Yep. It's, a, it's a Pākehā word. It's a, yeah. But if we use the word rungwa and whatever other language, then that's what we have. Right? So this process here is how we do what they do there. Yes. But something very different than... Some of it somewhat similar, but some of it very, very different. Um, yeah. That doesn't make it any less. And it's been able to shift into the, this is important for us. And the statistics tell us that. And they haven't gotten any better. And for the same reason that when we go to the doctor, it's not working, because we're talking about Parker methods. Yes. The Parker part of me, it's, you know, it's the Māori part of me, or the whole of me that needs help. You can't talk to the Māori part of me because you don't have that language. It's the same in, in the psychology space. While it can work sometimes, it's not going to work all the time because you can't speak Māori for me. I, the rungwa that I need is in my culture. Yes. You don't actually know how to access that. So you need to recognise how to find me that. You know, and that's not always done. Thank you for listening to the first part of our Kōrero with Hukarere. The second part will be released next Tuesday, so please come back as we continue storing together. Mā te wā. Unuhia, 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 te tapunui, kia wātea. Wātea i runga, wātea i raro, wātea i waho, wātea i roto, ka wātea, ka wātea. Ka wātea kia i o te noho, kia māma, te noho, kia ora, te noho. Ko e rā e rongo whakairi ake ki runga ke a tīna, aumie, huie, taiki e.